gentlemen, welcome to the Central Bank. I was born in San Fernando, and I, I attended Naprima High School a long, long time ago. One of the highlights of our school year was what we used to call intercall. Again, I'm talking to young people and you probably don't even know the expression intercall. Do you guys know the expression intercall? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> For us, you still have intercall? Yeah. 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 When I attended Naprima, one of the highlights of our school year was our annual game against presentation. And by the way, we lost almost every year, but that was beside the point. <laughs> but it was the highlight of our school year. Uh, and, you know, we lived and died, and we generally d died after the game because of it. I want to begin my discussion on a challenging subject, the private Eric Williams, by talking about an intercall. And we've got three guys from QRC here, right? These three guys were here from QRC. I want to begin with an illustration of a game between, a, of, I call it soccer, a soccer game between QRC and St. Mary's that took place a real long time ago. QRC ran onto the field. It was somewhere in the 1930s. And there were 10 fellows who ran onto the field. This is the big game of the year. 10 men ran onto the field. One man was absent. One student was absent, about well, 17 and a half, 18 years old. And he actually was captain of the team. He was absent not because he's a Trinidadian, he's usually late. Uh, <laughs> he was absent because his father said, I'm not going to allow you to play soccer in this game. You see, a few years earlier on, he was practicing soccer on the QRC field, and he fell, and he damaged his ear. He was about 14 or 15, and for the rest of the life, he had a damaged ear. The father didn't care about soccer. He didn't care about football. The father's dream was my son was going to win an island scholarship. You see, again, this is something that you young people don't know, but 30, 40, 50 years ago, only one person, the top student in high school, won an island scholarship that took him to free university education. The father's only concern in, in his life was my son will win an island scholarship and he'll have a free university study. See, the father didn't achieve very much in his life. In those days, he was burdened by all kinds of issues, and I'll talk about it, but he was definitely going to achieve all his dreams through his son. So KRC ran on the field with 10 players. Standing in the crowd was this young man. He went as a visitor to the game, and he was standing with his friend, looking at the game as it started. And as we know about this man, he gets agitated very fast. And he said, I'm not going to take this. I'm going to defy my father, something he had never done in his life. He said, I'm going to defy my father. His friend had a bicycle. I'm talking about a long time ago. He jumped on the, on the, arm, on, on the, arm, on the handlebars of the bicycle, ran down to his home, changed into a soccer outfit, came back and ran onto the field. And the QRC students absolutely roared because this was the best soccer player. They now had 11 men on the field, the captain was on the field with them. You know how these stories end, don't you? Who do you think scored the winning goal? The same guy. Do you know who that guy was? That guy was Eric Williams. And that's what, that starts the story of Eric Williams. That guy was Eric Williams. He ran onto this field and scored the winning goal. I asked his sister, what did, what did your father say about that? He, you, you know, Eric defied him. He said, well, he scored a winning goal, you know, that he couldn't say too much. <laughs> QRC beat St. Mary's that year in the intercall. Of course, the father was upset. He didn't care about soccer. He just wanted his son to win an island scholarship. And even though it was the biggest game of the year, he said, I don't care. Send 10 men on the field. But the son defied the father. You know, it was the guy who rode the bicycle, Halsey McShine, who ended out he probably died just two or three years ago. I got to know him very, very well in the last 10 years. Halsey ended up as one of the major surgeons on the island. And he and Eric were childhood friends from about the age of eight. Halsey rode the bicycle. Eric sat on the handlebars. They went home, got their sock halted, came back and scored a winning goal. You could make a movie out of this kind of thing, right? <laughs> That's the Eric Williams that we're going to talk about. I think I've lost about five minutes already, right? <laughs> There's going to be a challenge to move through this stuff. The William, uh, from, from what I'm saying, the Williams home, I'm sure you realize in the 1930s, was a pretty poor home. Poor in a sense, but clearly thousands of people were much poorer because the father worked in the post office, which meant he actually received a monthly wage. 
he started off at $65 a month. When he retired, when Eric was about to go to university, around 1939, he was making about 175 a month. And somebody said to me, sometime, he said to me, but 65 is a lot of money, not when you have 12 children. <laughs> Why do you think they had 12 children? You could probably guess the reason. No, no. <laughs> it's worse than that. Not, no, we didn't have television, but they were very devout Catholics. The father was an especially devout Catholic. I had a rare privilege, an incredible privilege, to meet Archbishop Pantin in Miami about five years ago. And I had a very fascinating interview with him, and, and Archbishop Pantin said to me, I was at that church, and Eric's father went to church every morning. I was there for mass, and Eric's father was in the front seat. That's why they had 12 children. And 11 of these children lived at $65 a month. When Eric was born, was the first child, the father was absolutely determined that this young man was going to be, become one of the national heroes of the country. And of course he did. But of course, you don't start at high school, you start at elementary school. Eric attended tranquility. And this is something, addressing the young people, you don't even know as well. In those days, almost everybody had to pay to attend high school. But I remember when CLR James went to high school, uh, the, the government granted four college exhibitions. The older people would have talking about college exhibitions. By the time Eric was a, a, in elementary school preparing for high school, the island had eight college exhibitions. So the top eight kids would go to high school for free. You know the story, Eric got one of the eight scholarships. And he attended QRC, which incidentally was an interesting issue also. He was a devout Catholic, where should he go to school? The father was a real devout Catholic, but not where education was concerned. <laughs> he had heard that QRC was the better school. I hope I'm not stepping on toes over here. And he said, Mary's people here, he, uh, QRC was a better school. And he said, regardless of religion, and he got into trouble with his parish priest. The guy was really upset with him, but he sent his son to QRC. He sent his son to QRC, and the son would come home, and you kids will probably know this, Memorizing Amo Ama Samant, Amamu Samatis. You know that, don't you? <laughs> we all suffered through Latin, didn't you? <laughs> Eric was an absolutely brilliant student because his father was determined that nothing was going to stand in, in his way of the son getting a scholarship. But even, even when he was in high school, he was an extremely well rounded individual. He captained the football, the soccer team, and he also played cricket for the first 11. And Halsey told me of a case where they went to Barbados. QRC went to Barbados, and the school did magnificently. Eric, of course, is scoring most of the, the goals again. So here we are, a family living under pretty difficult circumstances, limited income, 12 children, well, actually 11 survive, not very much money. And because they didn't have much money, the father did books in the evening, you know, bookkeeping. The mother did bake cakes and bread on the weekend. And Eric would go around helping them sell this. And that's the way the family got through. And Eric actually won a, won a scholarship and went off to England to study. He selected Oxford University. This was another fight. Sorry, this was another fight. Before he went to Oxford University, one year before, the father had already talked to a doctor. And the father had decided, my son will be a medical doctor. You know how parents used to be hung up on doctor and law? You guys know what I'm, the old ones know what I'm talking about, right? The father, and of course, did he ask the son anything? In those days, you don't ask the son anything. You will study, parents don't do that anymore. You decide what you're going to study, right? But the father said he will study the medicine. And Eric had his first big confrontation with the father after one of the And you know, he said to the father, by the way, who won the scholarship, I or you? <laughs> so the father gave in. He went to Oxford and studied and produced the magnificent doctoral thesis that became known when it was published as a book, Capitalism and Slavery. This is after about, from 19, about 1932 to 1939. His doctoral thesis that became known as the, the work Capitalism and Slavery and we hold conferences commemorating, commemorating that book. For the last five years at FIU, my school, my state school in Miami, I've been teaching mainly graduate courses, masters and PhD students on the Caribbean. And Capitalism and Slavery is one of my major textbooks. But I use a very unusual approach when I teach Capitalism and Slavery. I invite Erica Williams into my class. 
And for the last five years, Erica has come into my graduate class and introduced the book Capitalism and Slavery to the students. And she always has done an absolutely magnificent job reviewing capitalism and slavery and taking all kinds of questions, difficult questions for my students. I got to know her quite well when I did my first book back in 1985, and we worked very, very much together on my second book. Erica Williams is an unusual individual and an individual who had an exceptionally close relationship to her father. To switch my discussion a little bit. Uh, Eric, yeah, Eric Williams actually had three wives along the way. Probably most of you don't even realize that. Erica was actually the, the daughter of the second wife. While Eric was doing his PhD in London, he got married to a woman of St. Vincent heritage with whom he had two children, and he, they came over to Washington, and he worked at Howard University. This is Alistair and Pam. I believe, I think Alistair lives in Washington in the mother's house that's been in around for about 50 years, and Pam is probably in California. But Eric left that, that family when he came down to the Caribbean Commission in 1948. So Pamela really didn't know her father. When, when Eric left, Pamela was just a year old. Uh, and when he came down here, he got divorced and he got married to Erica's mom, who was a typist. And Erica was born soon afterwards, 1950. But within three years of the marriage, Soy Moyu died of tuberculosis in her, 19th, in, in the, in her 30s. She was probably 34 or 35, after a tragic four-day illness. Why, the only reason I'm saying that is that Eric was mother and father to Erica. And from all reports, he did an absolutely magnificent job. In preparing my second book on Williams, I spent one afternoon at a hotel somewhere in Port of Spain interviewing one of her childhood friends. And this girl would say to me that we would go to Erica's house for parties. And she observed, she said I was about six at the time. And she said, you know, I never saw a mother around. But I saw the father who was doing everything for the child. And he put together the most magnificent birthday parties. Erica and her dad were extremely close. But when he became the prime minister, he realized that he was not really able to look after her. So he sent Erica to England at the ripe old age of 12. And she, from then on, she came home only at, at Christmas and in the summers. But she and her dad had a very close, has had a very close relationship. Eric did get married much later on in life to a, a, a dentist. But it was an unusual marriage that the media has written all kinds of stuff about. We know a lot about the public Eric Williams. Very little is known about the private Eric Williams. How am I going to? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, we, we know a lot about the public Eric Williams. And, what's, and for the older people here, what do we know about the public Eric Williams? A little guy about five foot two, but dominated the society totally, largely by his intellect and also by his demeanor. A guy who could just open his mouth and have people melt. It was so sad, actually, when I did my interviews, a number of adults who worked with him actually ended up crying as they recall their incredible years of experience with this fella. Because they, know, they knew both sides of the man. They knew the public man, and they also knew the private man. We knew him as almost a dictatorial individual. And he used an expression that his mother used to use, who was a very stern individual. She would say, when I speak, let no dogs bark. <laughs> And that turned out to be Eric's favorite statement. And when he said that, the cabinet cringed and, and nobody barked. Everybody listened. But that was the public Eric. But very, very few people got admitted into the life of the private Eric. And when you hear the life of the private Eric, it absolutely blows you away. I called my book The Elusive Eric Williams, my second book on him because he was a very elusive personality. In public, he was dictatorial, he was stern, he was demanding, he was totally efficient. In private, I understand, you couldn't find a more loving individual. You couldn't find a more gracious individual. You couldn't find a more hospitable individual. And I interviewed a cabinet official who said to me, the guy never had any money in his pocket because he always gave it away. Some, the fellow said to me, he was a real soft touch. Two people took him left and right because he was just too generous. I, I got to know his secretary very, very well over the years, and she said, I would quarrel with the man all the time. His constituents would come in and say, 
could you pay my fees for high school? He said, sure, I'll pay your fees. On one occasion, the secretary said, I know the girl wasn't serious. He went along and paid the fees, and two days afterwards, she left school. But this was the kind of guy he was. Extremely generous, extremely loving, extremely hospitable. He had the most fun times around the bar in his house with his personal friends, and he alone mixed the drinks. But there's another side of his personality, as he would tell his friends, I'm going to mix the drinks. I don't want any bon anybody monkeying around with my drinks. He did happen to be a very suspicious individual. But his best times were with his friends sitting around the bar. These were friends who were with him for about 20 years, friends who wanted nothing official for him. They just enjoyed his company, enjoyed giving him the opportunity to bounce off ideas. But his most unusual, interesting relationship was his relationship to young people. Down in the lobby, downstairs there, there's, a, there's an Eric Williams sign that says, let me see if I could find it. The future of this country is in our children's school bags. And his life was the children of the country. And among the people that he was closest to, would you believe, were young people. There were young people that he invited to his home repeatedly, and not the parents, because he always wanted to find out how the young mind ticked. He was very close to two families. If you're really interested in this, I'm going to put in a plug. You should get the book. It's kind of expensive. <laughs> I don't get anything for it, but you should get the book. If you're interested in this, I have some fascinating stories of daughters of two families that he got to know very well. And here's a very interesting story. There was one family. Yeah, it was the daughters of the, the best, fam best family of Faisabad originally, and then Port of Spain. He got to know the girls very well, and they would have tea with him. And then they went up to England to study, and occasionally they'll come home and drop in and see him. How is he doing? And then he said to them one day, having tea at the house, one of these days, I'm going to visit you in London. And the girls never took him seriously. How is a prime minister going to visit a flat of two girls in an apartment in London? They're just students. They said, we, that guy wasn't serious. We didn't take him seriously until they got a call one day. Dr. Williams is having dinner in your flat in London tomorrow. And these girls absolutely panicked. He used to kid, kid them a lot that they, they grew up in a pampered lifestyle. They certainly didn't know how to cook rice. And he said, I'm coming to your house for dinner. The girls panicked. Guess who also panicked? The British Secret Service panicked. This man got to be crazy. He's going to go to a student's house. Is he going to be secure? You know the British Secret Service did? They, they shut down the entire street that day. And Eric came to these two students' house, but fortunately they had a flatmate who was really good at cooking rice. He, they didn't tell him this. But the flatmate cooked the rice. The girl served the appropriate wine. And when he left the house, his compliment was, when I get home, I'm going to tell your mother that now I know you could cook rice. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was. None of us know this, do we? That's the kind of guy he was. You know, and he had a ball, and this is uh, this kind of, he had a ball just talking to young people. And then he said to the two girls, look, Erica is it at a boarding school. Could you all take her, uh, take out on weekends? What it was, he was feeling guilty that he couldn't spend enough time with her. He was feeling guilty. He said, could you take her out one weekend? Eric never found out the story, but one weekend, the two girls decided to take Erica, she's probably about 13 or 14, on a boat trip. They rented a boat somewhere around Cambridge University on one of the little uh, uh, rivers, and they went on the boat. These girls had never had been in a rowboat before, and of course, they almost drowned, with, along with Erica with them. And for, the story as I found it, that they never told the father about what almost happened to his daughter. But he, 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 he missed his daughter terribly, but he just felt that he didn't have very much time for his daughter. So he loved young people. He had what he called the bar group that spent a lot of time with him. And there was also one other issue I want to bring up. His political relationships, of course, were largely with the black sector, sector of the society. But some of his private relationships were essentially with the French Creole sector of the society and the Chinese sector. His wife, of course, was Mayu, his second wife, Erica's mother. He was very close to a group that met for card playing for about 10 or 15 years. They met once a week at different people's houses and they played cards. 
and they would have a magnificent supper. And they would rotate to Eric, Eric's house from time to time. And either his maid cooked the meals, or he had, he had the meals catered from the Hilton. And this continued for about 15 years. And a number of people were there told me this was a totally informal group. Nobody talk, addressed him as my prime minister. Nobody asked him for a favor. Everybody just had a good time. But as we got in the late 70s, Eric's behavior, his demeanor, his health had changed. And he abruptly ended the group, as he abruptly ended everything else. I have a chapter in my book, I call it Political Exile. And as Eric continued on his path to power, he shared all kinds of people who were around him for one reason or another. So unfortunately, in the final years, he ended up as a very lonely figure. He was very disheartened by the 1970 revolution, and from the Black Power Revolution, and from 1970 until 1980, he moved his office to his home, and everybody came to his house for instructions. He came out once a week for a cabinet meeting, followed by parliamentary meetings. He lived at home, and he lived a very sedentary, relatively, relatively uh, quiet, isolated life. Erica was now in Miami, she was married, and for one reason or not, she actually stopped visiting. And he didn't encourage it because he was becoming increasingly suspicious in his later years. Halsey said to me, he was afraid that somebody would kidnap her. So he's, you know, he had maids at the house, they left at four o'clock, and from four until he went to bed, he lived alone at home. The maids prepared his supper, left it in the refrigerator, and he microwaved it himself and sat on the kitchen table and had his dinner. But in the last three years, two people came to the house every week. Halsey McShine came once a week to the house. To ch he had gave him a medical checkup, check his blood pressure, take blood if it's necessary, and they sat down and had a meal. And as Halsey would tell me afterwards, he never saw a guy who loves the sweet things like Eric Williams. And Eric Williams didn't realize at that point that he had diabetes. And he just loved all the sugary stuff that he could have. And he and Halsey did song having a ball. Halsey, being a surgeon, also didn't realize, he said to me, I never realized that I had diabetes. And just at the end, you know, the diabetes got a hold of him. There was another fellow, and I wouldn't mention the name, who came to the house, who we got to know in the very later years. A reporter who is now at Newsday, News sorry, Newsday. He got to know him through official means, and then they became very close friends. And the guy visited the house every week. But the guy never wrote anything about it. These were the only two people with Eric Williams, it, it, largely for the last few years. He did have a number of technocratic friends who would come in for business reasons, but then he wouldn't see them anymore. In the last few years of his life then, especially that last fateful weekend, and I was talking to Javon about it this, last night, and that last fateful weekend, Friday to Sunday, and I wrote an entire chapter on that from Friday to Sunday, very few people saw him, and he died quietly at his home on Sunday evening, sitting up in a chair. When the doctor arrived, he was, when, when Dr. Ince arrived, he was already dead. And by the time Halsey was called in, he checked the pulse, and there was no pulse. How do I summarize this? It's very, very difficult. How do I summarize this private Eric Williams? We're not talking about the, pri the prime minister Eric Williams, the public. Dr. Kojo is doing that. I'm supposed to talk to you about the private Eric Williams. Just a few points as I summarize this discussion, and I know I've gone over 25 minutes. Uh, Dr. Williams grew up in very diff difficult economic circumstances, like thousands of other Trinidadians. But had, he had a driven father who wasn't very, well very well educated, but was determined that education was going to be the means for mobility for his son. And he was determined, and to that extent, the father succeeded incredibly. The son won the, the college exhibition, he won the, the, the island scholarship, he eventually wrote a brilliant PhD thesis and had a brilliant academic career and then a brilliant political career. Eric Williams transcended his economic circumstances enormously and the challenge is for our young people to value education to that extent and to seek to transcend their economic circumstances. Another point, and I'm simply repeating myself, his public image was that of a stern dictatorial individual in private, one of the most generous, warm, loving individuals that you could find. One of his big disappointments in life, I think, as you read carefully in between the lines, is that to some degree, 
he was very much disappointed by the society that he helped create. And he helped not create, he helped to shape. He was thoroughly disciplined, thoroughly focused, knew what he wanted to achieve in life. And he repeatedly implied or talked about what he saw as the carnival mentality of the Trinidadian society. Do you know where he spent carnival weekend, pretty every carnival weekend? He spent it in Tobago writing, researching and writing his books. That's the kind of guy he was. And towards the end he was disappointed, especially in the 1970s, as the oil, oil boom meant instant affluence for Trinidad, and Trinidadians went on a spending binge that they seem to be repeating today. And he thought they were, they were excluding the more fundamental aspects of their life. He did attempt to alter the culture of the society. To some degree, some, to some degree he was successful. To some degree, he failed in, try, in, in trying to alter the culture of the society. And to some extent, he was a human being. And of course, as a human being, he made some mistakes. He was determined to stay in power. And to that extent, he could, probably could have paid more attention to some of the more fundamental aspects of national development. The importance of culture, the importance of, of uh, individual self-striving, importance of you know, people pulling up themselves by their own boots. He was, he was concerned to some degree about maintaining power. One of the, my final point, in writing his Inward Hunger, his biography, he entitled it Inward Hunger, and I do not think in the final analysis we could conclude that he satisfied his inward hunger. He had an enormous desire, like, like Dante's Ulysses, to master the human experience. He achieved enormously. He was enormously successful. But to some extent in the end, I think he himself would admit that he did not satisfy his inward hunger. Thank you.